Lord, remind us, Heavenly Father, of all that you have done for us and all that you will do in the future. Things that you have done in the past, the present, and we are looking forward. We know that you will continue to do these things, great things for us, Heavenly Father, even when our faith wavers, Heavenly Father. We ask, Lord, Heavenly Father, that you will help our unbelief. If we come needing a healing, a needing a blessing, yeah. Heavenly Father, a needing whatever we need, Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you help our unbelief if we don't believe, Heavenly Father. But Lord, we just give you all honor, praise, and glory this morning. Oh Lord, we ask you just to uh, bless our pastor once again as she bring forth the Holy Word. You will be with her this morning as she lifts up the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God for that fervent prayer. We thank God for the praise team for the selection. Let us know that God is an on time God. Yes, He Amen. is. He don't always come when we want Him to, but He is on time. Amen. Amen. At this time, I ask you to stand as we read John, the Gospel of John, the second chapter. I'll be reading verses 13 through 22. This morning I'll be reading in the New American Standard Bible Version. John 2, amen. Verses 13 through 22 reads, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And within the temple grounds, he found those who were selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away from here. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple. And yet you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he, he said this. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Verse 16 again, you, know, you may be seated. It talks about take these things away from here. Stop making my... Father's house, a place of business, but in the King James and other versions said, make, make it a, a den of thieves or a den of robbers. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this morning, I want to speak on this subject. It's time to clean house. Amen. It's time to clean house, saints. Well, just imagine for just a moment if you was attending a church service other than that great description. Well. And as you arrived at the church, you found a man standing at the entrance of the parking lot offering you a parking pass. He says the pass will cost you $2, but your car will be safe for the entire service. <clears throat> Upon entering the vestibule, you find warm and welcoming ushers offering you a bulletin for a cost of $2. These brightly colored and informative brochures are a must, and worshipers cannot enter the sanctuary without purchasing one. And as you walk past another usher, he notices that you don't have a Bible with you. Well, then the usher directs you to a table in the <laughs> sanctuary where you can rent one for use my, my. during the church service. For two dollars, amen. Well, mm. then as you settle comfortably into your padded pew, yet another usher quietly comes up and asks you whether you had paid the center aisle tax mm. to sit where you were sitting. My Lord. If not, he says, 
you have to move to the outer edge or to the back of the church, amen. But if you like, he said, he can arrange for you to have that center aisle tax paid. But guess what? Only $2 per week, amen? My, my. The service concludes with a call to come to the altar for prayer. Mm. The man goes forward to this place of prayer where a mercy seat counselor eagerly greets him and asks how may he help him. Then that counselor proceeds to say, for a prayer of praise and worship, please deposit $2 in the mm. available basket. For a prayer of confession and repentance, $4 is your payment. Mm, mm, mm. For a prayer of salvation, $6 is required. And for prayer for complete holiness, it's a bargain today of only $8. However, Clinic is complimentary on the church. Amen? It will. So my brothers and my sisters, how would you like to attend that church? Mm, mm, mm. Better yet, how do you think Jesus would react upon entering that church. You see, in many ways, that's exactly the kind of scenario that Jesus encountered at the temple in Jerusalem during the Passover celebration so many years ago that I read about. His house, his father's house, was to be a place of prayer. And Jesus came to pray. But when Jesus entered the outer courts reserved for the Gentile worshipers, he saw a marketplace. He saw a zoo, amen. Well, and Jesus got very angry indeed. So saints, I heard people say that Jesus really lost it that day. That he completely lost his temple and his school. That he just snapped. Well, this couldn't be farther from the truth. Yes, Jesus became angry at the abuse and unjust injustice, but Jesus never lose control. We don't serve a God who snaps when things are going wrong. Amen? Amen. But on the other hand, most of us have likely at some point lost our temple and done something or said something that we regret. Well, we may have physically struck out at someone or punched a wall, mm -hmm. punched a person, amen. We may have said some hurtful words to people. We may have been rude and judgmental towards someone. We've all like to all done things in anguish again that we wish we could do a do away. Amen. amen. But I, but I like us saints. Jesus never lost control. He did not leave that temple that day and ask himself, oh God, what was I thinking? Well, that was way over the top, even for me. Amen. No, he knew exactly what he was doing the whole time. He knew exactly what he was saying. Amen. And he didn't sin in his anger as we sometimes do. Amen? Amen. Now this passage of scripture is often misunderstood. And so I'm going to just walk through it and highlight some key information. Break it down. I'm just going to walk through the text. Amen. Break it down. And you see, this is not an isolated historical event. Interesting for us but it's available for our time today. No, this passage of scripture is very significant to us here today. That Jesus became angry in the temple, the house of God. God's dwelling place for the people of Israel. You see, the temple was the only place where humans could interact with the living God at that time. And even then, only select human beings, such as the high priest, could enter the holy of holies to commune with God. Well, this was the one place where the high priest could place their sacrificial offerings onto the altar and ask God to cleanse the people 
from their sins. So as we get started, let's look back again at verse 13 for a moment. It reads, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. And we saw that Jesus is God, is the on time God. On time. Amen. Amen. So in this verse, we find that Jesus had a purpose when he selected this specific time to come to the temple. He selected the time of Passover. Passover is the Jewish celebration of their liberation from Egypt. It specifically celebrates the time when God had placed judgment upon the uh, is in Egypt that all firstborn males would be killed if the Hebrew people were not released. And God told the Hebrews to kill a perfect male lamb and spread its blood on their door frames. And then when the angel, the death angel came by, it would pass over the house of God's people during that night of killing. And if he did not see the blood, amen, he would enter in and slay the firstborn boys, amen. During the celebration of Passover, people came from miles around to the temple to praise God and to offer up sacrifices. So again, Jesus selected this specific time when he knew that the temple would be bursting over, amen, with people. People was coming to teach us the stuff, amen. It was an important message that Jesus wanted the people to know, amen. So he wanted as many people there as possible to hear the message firsthand. Hot off the press. You know, something about hearing things firsthand for yourself and stuff instead of getting secondhand information, amen. You know how people tend to add things and, and, and take away things, amen, when they try to repeat the story. Well. But Jesus wanted them to hear directly from him. Amen. And so in verse 14 it says, in the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves. And then he found others sitting at the table exchanging money. Amen. This area would, would have been the outer courts again, reserved for the Gentiles to worship. Gentiles were non-Jews. And such were seen as being somewhat further down the spiritual pecking order, amen. They were not allowed to come up front, amen, like you can come up front and sit, amen, on the front pew, amen, without paying a fee, amen, amen. Now, uh, 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 many people use this scripture to justify that selling anything in church on Sunday it's a bad thing. You know, people take things out of, take word out of context, amen. However, the selling of the cattle, the sheep, and the doves, and the exchange of money is not the problem that Jesus is addressing in our text, amen. Each person coming to the temple was required to bring an offering, and each offering was for a specific purpose, amen. And money exchangers could have been a very good and useful service to the people coming to worship. But again, it was abuse. You see, these men exchanged money all right. But on top of that, they took the opportunity to charge huge interest rates on the exchange. And on top of that, they claimed that only specific temple money could be used so that even if they had currency of Jerusalem, they would still have to exchange it for their money, amen. And so they were making profit off the people that came to worship God, amen. This did not sit well with Jesus. And he had to address the issue. So likewise, we see something that we think is wrong going on in God's house. Bring it to my attention, amen. Don't you want to take the matter to your own hand, amen. Let me decide 
if it's wrong or not. Because sometimes we don't always know if something is wrong or right. Sometimes we put our own personal preference in there. Amen? Amen. So the Bible says Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those people who were buying and selling there. Was Jesus upset because people are exchanging money and selling animals in the temple courts? No. He was upset. Listen to me. He was upset because they were crooks, amen. He called them a den of robbers, a den of thieves, amen. Again, it had nothing to do with selling in the house of the Lord. Like some trying to describe to this verse. I found this story about this sweet old lady Will? who came to a pastor one day, very upset. And she said, Pastor, every time I see someone set up a table in our church for you to set up tapes or books or whatever, I just want to take a whip and walk through there and turn over the tables and then run the people out just like Jesus did. Well, the pastor, you know, he took his Bible and he walked through this passage and showed her that Jesus, again, was the set that they were buying and selling in the temple courts. He was upset because they were cheating the people. Jesus didn't say, my house should be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of commerce. No, he said, you have made it a den of thieves of robbers. Amen. Amen. He explained there was a certain amount of commerce that had to take place in the temple. Again, people from other countries had to exchange their coins into the Jewish temple because it would have been blasphemy to offer a coin with a graven image stamped on it. But the money changes charge exorbitant prices to change the money. Also, the ones coming from long distance had to have animals for the sacrifice. But again, these crooked merchants were in cahoots with the corrupt priests. Because if a priest brought a lamb from his home, a priest had to approve it before he would be allowed to, before he allowed them to offer it as a sacrifice. And so the priest got in the habit of disallowing the lamb and, 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 and the direct, uh, the one that was bringing it. Because he wanted them to go to his buddy running a business selling so-called approved Will. land. And so they were trading their land, mm. pay more money, and then the land dealer would turn around and sell that very land that the priest has earlier declared unsellable. Oops. Again, they had a racket going on in God's house. My, my. They used the Lord's house and the people's understanding of their need to repent through sacrificial offers as a way to line their own pockets. Saints, the same thing goes on today in some of God's houses. As humorous or as outrageous as my opening story was in the beginning about paying someone to pray for you. It happens in less subtle forms today. People sometimes pay to get special prayer claws or prayer hangers. That's right. They pay for special holy water so they think it's holy water because they are told some miracle is attached to them. Don't you know that you can pray on your own handkerchief? Don't you know that you can pray over your own oil or water, amen. amen? You don't have to have somebody to charge you, amen, to do the thing that you can do for yourself, amen? amen. Again, in our text, these people were using the temple for convenience. They were making it convenient to purchase animals. They were meeting the needs of the people at the expense of the temple's sacredness. However, we are never to misuse the Lord's sanctuary Amen. just for convenience sake. Amen? Amen. Yet, the Lord's sanctuary is not a place 
place strictly for convenience. Indeed, we want our church to be acceptable and convenient for people to come, amen. amen. But again, we must never exchange the sacredness of the Lord's house to make it convenient for, for anything and everything to go on in the church. Same thing applies to our house, amen. Your personal house. You need to make sure that you maintain sacredness in your own house. Amen. You should allow everything to go in and on right. in your house. Amen. Right. You need to take charge of your house. Set boundaries, set rules, amen, for what's going on, what you allow to take place in your house. Amen. Amen. Sometimes the Christian life is inconvenient according to the world standard. Amen. Well. Yeah. Some people say, Pastor, it's inconvenient for me to be at church at 10 on Sunday morning. Amen. I'm used to going to church at 11 o'clock. Amen. Sometimes people say, Pastor, it's inconvenient for me to be faithful to church. It's inconvenient for me to tithe or to serve in ministry. You see, serving Jesus is not about convenience. Hmm. I think it's amen. Well, it's about commitment. Amen. Commitment is not just for the pastor. Amen. You know, you yeah, ask the pastor will be here on Sunday morning. But what about your commitment? Amen. To not forget, forsake the assembly of yourself. Amen. Well, it's not just for leaders. Amen. Com commitment is for every Christian. Amen. Because if we can't be committed in the little things, how can God trust us with more responsibility? Amen? Well, Some people say, Pastor, I want to be a deacon. I want to be a deacon this, amen. But are you committed, amen, to doing what you're supposed to do, amen? Are you committed, amen, to serving on some of the less, uh, less, 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 don't you think? Positions, amen. Amen. You want to be up at the top, amen. But you have to work your way to the top, amen. 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 So again, how can people be trusted to be leaders, amen? When they don't even show up, amen. Amen. They use every excuse not to show up. Well, perhaps you know I'm a little tired, amen. I had a rough week, amen. So I'm just gonna stay in, amen. Pastor, I got a little ache in my body. I think I'm just going to stay on my end, amen. That same ache is with you, but you get up and go to work, amen. amen. That same time is with you, but you press your way to the job, amen. You press your way to a sport event, or you press your way. People do what people want to do, amen. Well. And so Jesus took a whip to drive out the dishonesty. Jesus saw that these men were more interested in lining their own pockets than bringing the spotless offering to the king. Jesus saw that these men were more com concerned with their own profit margin, amen, than the salvation of their neighbors. And so, he got angry. Well, you know, he didn't just get upset. He got angry. He made himself a whip of cords. Mm -hmm. And he drove them all out. Now, somebody said, Oh, the pastor's abusing the people. Here, Jesus abusing the people. Amen. But Jesus was consumed by zeal for his father's house. Now, people sometimes ask, Does God? Get angry. Yes. He gets angry. Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. Well, Not that some days. He is angry with the wicked and the sinners every day. Every day. But it's not like, like our anger. Amen. He has a righteous anger. Yes. It's the anger towards Injustice and sin, wickedness. It's an anger towards people like these money changers, amen, who are famous 
the temple of God. But at the same time, it's anger under control. Jesus doesn't just blow up here and lose control. As I said, he's always on, in control. He takes the time to either find a whip, and then he drives these money changers out of the temple. He flips over the tables, scatters the money all over the ground. I can see the people now that's on their knees pick up this money. Amen. Well, now, what is he doing? We have this money. But the whole point of this is that these had taken God's house of worship and made it something sinful. This lets me know by Jesus' actions that sometimes it's okay to get angry when the things of God are being defiled or, de or, or desecrated. Amen. Sometimes anger is appropriate. Never say don't get angry. It says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Amen. So we all need to have a righteous zeal about the things of God. Amen. When the Bible is attacked and belittled, it should anger us. Right. When sacred images of the Lord, or some things like the Lord's Supper are marked, mm -hmm. amen, it should make us angry. Mm -hmm. When the blessed name of God or Jesus Christ is cursed, blasphemy, it should fill us with righteous indignation. Sometimes it's right to get angry, as Jesus did, over the desecration of the things of God. Because sometimes our silence is read as acceptance, amen. Yeah. That we are signing on to wrongdoing. And so the Jewish authorities were set, as you can imagine. And they asked Jesus in verse 18, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority? To do what you did, amen? Mm -hmm. Jesus has told them, destroy this temple. And I will raise it again in three days. Now the Jews didn't understand that in verses 18 to 22, that Jesus was talking about his own body. About his own death on the cross. And his resurrection on the third day. They believed that the temple was some 46 years in the making. And was the one and only place that can only be considered the meeting place of God. They believed that only animals could be sacrificed to cleanse people from their sins. And but Jesus, saints, changed all that. Because when Jesus came to the earth, it was to offer himself as a living sacrifice once and for all. He lived among us. He was tempted, sinless, and perfect. He suffered and died on the cross to cleanse us from our sins. But on the third day, he rose. He rose again with all power in his hands. You see, Jesus was the final Passover lamb. And upon that event, the temple as a building became obsolete as the only place where God's presence resided. Amen. Now, there's no need for a special meeting place because it's possible for the living God to, to reside within you and I at all times. When we accept Christ into our lives as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit resides in us. Amen. But this, this is not saying then that we don't need to come out to the house of God. It is saying that this is not the only place that we can meet with God. Amen. Under the old covenant, you see, God dwelt in buildings. Under the new uh, covenant, he dwells in people. Will. Because Paul wrote to the Corinthians, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Amen. You were bought with a cross. Amen. Therefore, all of God with your body. Hallelujah. Take God wants to honor him with our bodies. Amen. amen. He wants to take care of our bodies. Amen. He don't want us to fornicate with our bodies. Amen. He don't want us to lack with our bodies. Amen. He don't want us to steal and kill with our bodies. Amen. We have to honor God with our bodies. Amen. It's important today to realize that God is not moved by builders made of brick and mortar. Man's building project does not impress God, nor does it move his heart. You see, building projects are the result 
a man's desire and not God. So what moves the heart of God is his people. God loves people. God loves people so much that he sent his only the God and Son into this world to die for us and make it possible for his Son, the Holy Spirit, rather, to indwell us and give us eternal life. Amen. Saints at the temple of the living God. There's a very important role that we as Christians have to play. Let me ask you this. When they see us, do they see us representing Christ? When they look at us, when we call ourselves Christians, what do they see? Well, do they see Jesus in us? Do they see the light in us? Or do they see what they see in people in the world? Are we blending in with the world? Are we standing out as Christians? Will they see a marketplace looking to make a deal? Will they see a money changer seeking a quick profit? Will they see someone judging them by the way they dress, way they talk, by their gender orientation, by the color of their skin, their occupations? Or will they be judging it by where you live? Will. Or will they see a person that's just like Jesus? Loving, kind, yes. merciful, yes. forgiving, praying, yes. helpful, and so forth. My, my. After many years in the ministry, I am convinced, saints, that the greatest hindrance for people coming to Christ today is the hypocrisy they see in church people. And we need to let Christ clean us up if we're going to be fruitful and we are going to live as Christ wants to live. If there is sin and hypocrisy in our religion, then we will do more harm to people than good. And if we want to be effective in our ministry as a church, leading people to God and not away from God, then we need to let Christ clean us out of this religious hypocrisy. Amen. Amen. One lesson we learn from this passage is that God wants prayer in this house. Amen. Jesus said again, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. Saints, Jesus wants every church to be a house of prayer. Amen. Amen. In the temple worship, there was music, sacrifices, teaching, offering, and fellowship. But God never said that his house would be a house of singing, or a house of offering, or a house of teaching. He said, plain and simple, it's supposed to be a house of prayer. And not just for the Jews, for all people. So we're not doing some praying, saints. We're not a house of prayer. Amen? Mm -hmm. I long for the day for we are known as a great praying church. Amen. And as an individual temple, Jesus wants to make us a house of prayer. I believe the best barometer to gauge our spiritual health is our prayer life. When teachers, people talk about us, do they ever say, well, he or she is a real prayer warrior? Is your life like a house of prayer? Are you praying for people? Are people coming to you for prayer? And when they come to you, do you direct them to the pastor or the deacon? Do you pause what you're doing and pray for them? Amen. Amen. Another lesson we learn from this passage is that God won't live in a dirty house. You might live in one, but God won't. He is holy. And he can't abide the presence of sin. If Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem, maybe he has some house cleaning he needs to do here in us personally and that greater spiritual. 
It's vitally important that we look upon ourselves as the temple of God. Because he resides within us. Therefore, we need to keep our temple clean. Again, Jesus don't live in a dirty house. So some, it's time for some spring or summer or some winter or some fall cleaning in our home. Amen. It's time to get our hearts right and love everyone. It's time to get our hands right and help people. It's time to get our eyes right and stop judging people. It's time to get our mouths right and stop gossiping and lying. Let's take a look at ourselves. Examine ourselves. Not your neighbor, but examine yourself. Amen. The house of the Lord has to be your clean house. Again, examine yourself and determine if there is something in you that is found God's temple. Is there something that Jesus needs to drive out? Something that stands between you and your worship of a holy God? Only you can answer that. And only Jesus can cleanse us with the word of God. Yes. You see, Jesus drove the money exchanges out. What does Jesus need to drive out of you today? What's in your life that's keeping you from worshiping him in spirit and truth? Well, The Holy Spirit of God lives within us. And again, he dwells within a clean vessel. Yes. Now I'm preparing to bring this message to a conclusion. Only the best part could be born into God's temple. Amen. Now our bodies are the temple of God. And he wants to dwell in a clean temple. Now I'm not talking about the clothes have to be swept and wrapped them, amen. The, the cobwebs have to be moved and all that. I'm talking about your body. He wants to dwell within your body. He also wants to dwell within this sanctuary too, amen. Now, our bodies, again, are the temple. Therefore, do not allow things into God's temple that cheapen it. Do not allow greed to control your heart and your wallet. Do not allow anger to drive your responses. Do not allow unforgiveness to block your prayers for being answered. Again, hear me. God doesn't want no dirty house. Amen. Amen. He won't fill a dirty vessel. Mm. He won't use a dirty vessel. Mm. Well. If you have some dirt that needs to be swept away mm. from your Christian life, yeah. pray like David in Psalms 51 and 10. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me, Lord. Lord, Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, proud and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Amen. Amen.
do is trust him and put our hands in the hand of the Lord and give him our heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he's there. He's there to, to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He's there to save us. Amen. Because he died for the sins of the world. Amen. He died so that we may be free. He died for us so we may be clear. Amen. Amen. He was to, to do what no other person, what no other man can do. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, I stand at the door and knock. And all who will open that door and answer. Amen. He will save them. Salvation will be theirs. Amen. Who is ready to open the doors of their heart? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So that Jesus Amen. and the Holy Spirit can step in yeah. and clean Amen. us and make us brand new. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Brand new. Amen. Only he can do that. Hallelujah. Whatever you may be have done, we ask that you give your hand to the Lord. Just give it to him. Ask him to give you a clean heart. Amen. And to renew a right spirit within you. He went to Calvary. Amen. He died and bled just for you. Amen. He wants to cleanse anything and all things that's within us. He wants to cleanse us. The pastor preached a powerful, a powerful message about Jesus Christ and his love and his power to do the cleansing in our spirit, man. Amen. So if there, if you have not yet given your heart unto the Lord, and if you haven't yet confessed yes, your yes, sins, yes, yes, amen, amen, and say, Lord, I confess my sins. And so I need you to do the right thing that's within my heart. Amen. amen. He says that he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen. And that is a promise that he has done. He has done, he, he has made that promise for us. Amen. His love is greater than any earthly love that you can encounter. Amen. Because he says, I have a plan for you. I want to save you. I want to give you salvation. I want to make you brand new in Jesus' name. All those who haven't given their heart to the Lord, please come forth. Please come forth because the Lord is waiting. Do not leave out of these doors. Do not leave out without first coming to the house of God to give your heart unto the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. If there's anyone that's ready to give their, their uh, confession to the Lord, I pray that you will come forth. Don't be afraid. If if you are afraid, somebody in the house of the Lord mm -hmm. will come forth and walk you down. Amen. Amen. And we will
will stand with you. Amen. Amen. We will stand with you. Amen. We will pray the prayer of, of salvation, the prayer of faith for you. Amen. Come on and give God some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we rush through the invitation. Amen. But sometimes people need a little bit more time to make up their mind. Amen. We want them to make up their mind why they still have time. Amen. Time is something that we don't have. Amen. It's unknown to us. Amen. And at any point, the time could be taken away from us. By the time giver. Amen. 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 So again, we just thank God for the invitation. We do our part and we leave. Amen. The planting, we plant, but we leave the watering and the increase to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we pray that this word will take part in somebody's heart. Amen. Even if they leave here, amen. Let that word churn and burn. In the spirit. Amen. Because some people, like I said, they're in church. As I preached one time. The body's here. Amen. But the church is not in them. Amen. Amen. They are not the church of the true and the living God. Because they never fully gave their lives to Jesus Christ. It's more than just showing up on a Sunday morning. Amen. It's more than just putting your name on the church roster. Amen. It's believing in your heart, as he said, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And making your confession. Amen. Some people are ashamed to confess. Amen. But that's part of your salvation. Amen. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why confession is important? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you confess out of your mouth, amen, your ears hear it, amen. And it goes into your heart. Amen. Yeah. Church is praying time. Amen. Yeah. Amen. This indeed is a house of prayer. When I studied this last thing, I got a chuckle out of it. When it talked about the, the people charging for prayers. Amen. Yeah. I said, Lord, if I charge, I should be rich. I should be a millionaire. Many yeah. prayers I pray for people. Amen. Many well. prayers I pray for myself. Amen. And I do it. No charge. No charge. Somebody prayed for me. Had me on their mind. Took the time. Prayed for me. Jesus prayed for me. Had me on his mind. Took the time. And prayed for me. And so I'm praying it forward. I'm praying for somebody else. Amen. 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 So we can ready to go. To look to the Lord for prayer. Before we pray, though, I just want to see if any, any visitors, even online or in here, amen, any first-time visitors, if you're worshiping with us for the first time online, please drop your name and your contact information, amen, and so I can reach out to you, amen, amen, amen. So let's get ready to pray, saints. Let's get ready to pray. Lord God, we come today, Lord God, as we've come many times before, and we don't just pray while we're in the building. We pray, God, according to your word. You said, man, I should always pray and not faint. You said we should pray without ceasing. That means we pray in our homes. We pray on our jobs. We pray up and down the highways. We pray in the grocery stores. We pray, God, because dangers is around every corner, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we come praying in the sanctuary today, calling on your name, God. Calling on your name, God. Because you said we ask anything in the name of Jesus, that you will hear us and that you will answer us, Lord God. So we are praying in Jesus' name this morning, God. That you would, Lord God, have mercy on us, Lord God. That you would have mercy on us, God. Lord God, we pray many times 
for Sister Margie Talley, for Lord God, Friday, I believe, she transitioned onto the other side. And so now we're praying for her family that's left behind. We pray for her daughter, Sabrina, Lord God. We pray for her sons. Don't know their names, Lord God, but you know God. We pray for her grandchildren, Lord God. And we pray for other relatives, Lord God, that's near and dear to her, God. We pray for their peace and their comfort, Lord God. Not only that, we continue to pray for the family of Bridget and Patty Harvey, Lord God. Utilize, utilize their sister on Thursday, Lord God. But Lord God, they're still grieving, Lord God. And Lord God, we pray for those here today, God. Some are still grieving, Lord God. The passing of a husband, the passing of a mother and a father, the passing of a sister or a brother, the passing of a child, God. We continue to pray their comfort right now, God that you will strengthen them, Lord God, that you will give them, Lord God, your peace, Lord God, that you will continue, Lord God, give them hope to continue to win this race with patience, Lord God. And we continue, Lord God, pray for Geisha Harris, Geisha Harris, Hayes, rather, Lord God, Nan Swan, Crystal Williams, Barbara Burns, Veronica Bowman, Daryl Dyson, Nina Small, Emily, and Lennox, Lord God, continue to pray, God, for Hugh Stevens and Lord God, Lakeisha Harrison, Vanetta Hutchins, and so many more, Lord God. They're going through, Lord God. But Lord God, the good news is they are not going through alone. That you are walking with them in their times of sickness and distress. That you can hold their hand, Lord God. That you know their names, Lord God, and that you are calling their names, Lord God, to the Father, Lord God, and for healing, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we are also standing in the gap, God, for our brothers and our sisters, Lord God. Some might be too weak to pray on their own right now, Lord God, but Lord God, we are praying, Lord God, that you will build another Larry leaning side right now in the name of of Jesus, Lord God. Some are suffering with colds and flu and even COVID, Lord God. We continue to pray, God, that you will cleanse this world from all these germs and the viruses, Lord God. We pray for those who are having health challenges, Lord God. Lord God, I continue to pray for Oscar Ward, Lord God. I continue to pray, Lord God, for all my sisters and my brothers, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for the family of those under the sound of my voice, Lord God. Lord God, somebody's praying for their mother, God. Somebody's praying for their spouse, God. Somebody's praying for their child, God. Asking you to have mercy on them, Lord God. Lord God, you are God of all mercy, a God of all comfort, Lord God. And Lord God, that mercy they had on yesterday is not sufficient for today. And so you are giving us new mercy, God. You've given us new grace, God. You've given us, Lord God, a present help today, Lord God. And we appreciate that, Lord God, that you are coming to see about your children, Lord God. We are praying, God, that you restore sight to the blinds, Lord God. That, Lord God, that you will regulate heart problems, Lord God. Lord God, that you will open up the deaf ears, Lord God. That you will heal the sickle cell and the mother cirrhosis, Lord God. That you will heal the migraine and the diabetes, Lord God. That you will heal the arthritis and the bursitis, Lord God. That you will heal, Lord God, every organ, Lord God. That you will renew lungs and kidneys, Lord God. Lord God, we are praying, God, that you take care of these stomach issues, Lord God. So that you will take care of, Lord God, the fog of brains, Lord God. The mental issues, Lord God. That you will bring clarity, Lord God. That you will bring peace in the minds right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. That you will take away the worry, take away the stress, Lord God, and allow them to cast all their cares upon you, because you care for them, Lord God. Lord God, you are the burden bearer in the heaven no share, Lord God. Lord God, we are not equipped, Lord God, to bear these burdens, Lord God. So, Lord God, we know that Jesus alone can bear our burdens, Lord God. 
And so again, we ask you, Lord God, to take them away, Lord God. Sometimes we don't have the sense enough to give them to you, God. But we ask you, Lord God, to take it from us, Lord God. Lord God, take those from us, Lord God. Take those yokes upon yourself, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God. Lord God, we pray for again for the military. We pray for those in hospitals, Lord God. Those in nursing homes, those in rehab, Lord God. Those in mental institutions, Lord God. Wherever your people are, God, we are lifting them up, Lord God. We are praying for the unemployed, Lord God. We are praying, Lord God, that they will find employment, Lord God. Lord God, we sung again that you are on time, God, Lord God. And somebody might be wondering how long, Lord God. But Lord God, let them continue to hold on until that job comes. Hold on until that change comes, Lord God. Hold on. Don't give in to despair, but hold on and wait on you. And while they're waiting, Lord God, let them be of good courage, Lord God. Let them be of good cheer, Lord God. Because, Lord God, let them know that you have it all under control, Lord God. And then, Lord God, we are praying for the incarcerated, Lord God. Lord God, you know these names, Lord God, that I have on my prayer list, Lord God. Lord God, I pray that you will move, Lord God, in those situations, Lord God. Some of them just need some mercy, Lord God. As I prayed before, they made a mistake, Lord God. Lord God, they didn't listen to mom and dad, Lord God. They thought they knew what was best, Lord God. And they found themselves, Lord God, in a whole mess of trouble, Lord God. And now they're calling on mom, Lord God. They're calling on dad. But Lord God, help them to call on you, Lord God. Help them to call on you, Lord God. Help them, Lord God, to repent, Lord God. Ask them, Lord, help you, Lord God, to them or give them a second chance, Lord God. Lord God, let them know that they too can get a prayer through, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God. And Lord God, we lift up, Lord God, people all over, Lord God. No matter their occupation, God. No matter their gender association, Lord God. The word of God says we have to pray for all people, Lord God. All kingdoms, Lord God. And so we praying, God, for everybody, God. We praying for our enemies, Lord God. We praying for those who are doing wrong, saying the wrong thing, Lord God. We praying for the unsaved, Lord God. And Lord God, they have come to you. We praying for the backslider, Lord God. That they have come back to their first love, Lord God. We praying, Lord God. Lord God, for those, Lord God, that don't think they need prayer, Lord God. And Lord God, we praying for the foolish. We praying for the wise, Lord God. We praying for the pastors. We praying for the churches. We praying for the deacons, Lord God. We praying for the children. We praying for the teenagers, Lord God. We praying for our seniors, Lord God. We praying, Lord God, for everybody, everywhere, God, that you will move in their situation, Lord God. That you will come to their rescue, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God. We pray in God over our financial situations, Lord God. We pray for the church's finances. We pray for our individual finances, Lord God. We are praying, God, that you continue, Lord God. Open up the windows of heaven, Lord God. And Lord God, pour our blessings, Lord God. But we pray also that we be obedient to your command to give, Lord God. Just like the widow, Lord God, Lord God who gave her might, Lord God. She didn't have much to give, but she gave, Lord God, out of her abundance, Lord God. She gave out of her poverty, God. She gave, Lord God, knowing that you could make all grace abound to her, Lord God. That you, knowing that you could turn our little into much, Lord God. But sometimes we just have to release it to you, God, instead of trying to hold on, Lord God. Because the seed won't grow, Lord God, unless we plant it in the ground, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we need to plant that financial seed, Lord God, in order to reap the harvest financial, Lord God. And so we thank you, Lord God, that we are going to be givers, Lord God, not necessarily always looking to receive, God. So help us, Lord God, to give, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, even to learn how to receive also, Lord God. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. And we just thank you for hearing our cry, God. Hearing our plea this morning, Lord God. We thank you and we give it to you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.